Hey, how's it going? I just want to thank you very much for watching episode 105 of Boundary Break. It's a show where we try to take the camera outside the game's boundaries to find anything, whether it be left behind content or sometimes just explain developer techniques. And let me tell you something, we have a really special treat on this channel today because speaking of developer techniques, who better to explain that than the developer himself, the director of LEGO Star Wars, John Burton. This is absolutely incredible. And before I even forget, John has his own YouTube channel where he explains a lot of developer techniques in really great detail and I recommend that you check the link down below so that you can check out his channel as well but yes John thank you so much for adding some legitimacy to boundary break and I cannot wait to let you hear what he has to say about some of the more mysterious aspects of my findings on this week's episode you can probably already tell that I'm ready so let's do it so right off the bat I want to hit you with something really cool really quick I took a very brief look at the complete saga on the Wii most of this episode is going to be the two individual games on the GameCube, but I did look at the hub area here and I noticed that there was a snowman outside the boundaries, which was really unusual. I was trying to figure out how it could be applied anywhere for any reason on this map, let alone the game itself. So I uh, reached out to John and this is what he had to say about it. Regarding the snowman, my memory is a little hazy, but I think it had something to do with a planned Lego Indiana Jones level. I think the snowman would have blocked the way in the bonus room to an Indiana Jones level, but in the end I think we weren't allowed to do the level and so replaced it with the trailer instead. I think it was a snowman because the level was planned to be Nepal. This was almost too good to be true. In fact, when I finally got control of Vader, I made him die multiple times just to make sure you don't get to see it, and you don't. But in the player model for Darth Vader, if you take the camera inside of his helmet, there is a fully modeled head inside. One that has a face that's completely different from the one that you see in an end cutscene of the original trilogy, which I'm sure raises a lot of questions about the other characters with helmets. The stormtroopers are a little bit different. They have a black head with no face, but they have a white peg that goes through the head. And Jango Fett is just absolutely hilarious. What they do here is that they take the head of the original Jango Fett and then spin it backwards so that the black part of his head model is showing in the mask, but his face is still inside of the mask. And for the record, the same cannot be said for Boba Fett. And if you want to know what certain characters look like without a helmet, it's pretty terrifying. Like for example here, Yoda has a set of teeth and uh, I don't think you're really meant to get a good look at those teeth. I think it's just supposed to be an accented feature. But no, seriously, the biggest deal here is the fact that Darth Vader has two faces in the same game, which I can understand. You can see his neck underneath the helmet, so that has to be black, but certainly there had to be no face involved. Alright, I fully admit this is not a boundary break type segment, but I actually did get a request for it on my Twitter account, so why not? It's who shot first in LEGO Star Wars, and I found the results to be kind of interesting. Now because I can slow down the footage on the 60 frame per second game, we can see the moment in which Greedo reaches for his gun, and it's in that moment when he's reaching for the gun that Han Solo already has his gun out and fires the shot. But to bring this back to an educational experience, you might notice that there's two torsos on this single frame. That's because that torso that flies out of Greedo's body is not his original torso, that's a prop. And when you see Greedo without his torso, that's a swap model. And so what you're seeing here is the prop and the swap model at the same time. Also, if we take the camera outside the boundary so that we can get back to what this show is supposed to be about, you might notice a little gray cube underneath the map. Now, fans of my show know that we find gray cubes every once in a good while, and unfortunately, without the word from the developer, we don't know what they do, what purpose they serve. I think you probably have an idea of where I'm taking this next, so please John, if you don't mind explaining. With the game engine we had written for the LEGO games, any objects that we wanted to give programmers control over were called special objects. The artist could give them unique names in the 3D scenes which would allow the programmers to use these objects for things that weren't covered by the normal game code. So in this cantina scene for instance, the holographic time and percentage complete needed updating by the programmers all the time, so it was a very specific use case. So the artists put all the elements they needed in the cantina scene and the programmers could then write the specific code needed to create the holographic display using these components. The other things you see are probably used for the shop for the same reasons. Okay, now we're going to do a couple of zoom outs. This one right here is from the original trilogy, and as you're going to see, I can't pull it too far out because at a certain point you just end up on the other side of the sky dome. But that's okay, as long as we stay on the other side of the geometry, you should be able to see the entire area in one shot. 
which for the simplicity of LEGO Star Wars, this is not too shabby. I'm also able to show you something really cool here, which is the trenches of the Death Star. These sequences have a very restricted camera, so zooming this out is really awesome because you have the entire map in one shot, there's no culling here, and there's just an immense amount of detail because of just how the Death Star looks in the movies. Which I guess is my way of saying, don't be too disappointed that you don't see the entire Death Star in one shot. That would take an immense amount of resources in order to pull off. And here is one more zoom out from Epic episode one. I had to be a little bit tricky here because there is a lot of culling in this version of the game. So what I had to do here is I used the debug menu of the GameCube version and I used the camera from that to pull it as far back as I possibly could, which as I'm realizing now, it was more of a field of view effect than anything else. And then from there was my own set of tools that does not affect the culling, but since the in-game camera is pulled far enough back, we got this beautiful shot of this entire building. So even though we already talked about gray cubes earlier, there are a lot of gray cubes in the game. And I saw gray cubes in certain areas that remind me of older episodes, like the gray cube we once found underneath the tank in the Metal Gear Solid Twin Snakes episode. So I thought this is another great opportunity to see exactly what this gray cube does when it's in the context of a large object that moves around on the screen, which you know exactly what that means. So the small gray cubes, and you may well find more of them hidden around the place, were generally used to give the programmers a handle to be able to move complex objects easily. So they again would be special objects that the programmers could get hold of, but the artists could link these cubes to much bigger and more complex sets of objects that the programmers could move by just moving the small cubes. Or sometimes they were used as locations for the programmers to add in particle effects before our engine supported artists being able to do that directly. Okay, I feel like I've been holding this one back long enough. It's one of my favorite things about this episode. So get this, every single cutscene in LEGO Star Wars is in-game, of course, but they don't load separate rooms at all during any of these cutscenes. Every single scene is in one map. And in some cases you might feel that makes sense. Most of the cutscene takes place in one area, so no big deal, right? Well, even for scenes like that, you can still find the actors waiting in place before they are used in those cutaway scenes. So to explain, this cutscene here on Hoth has three different Luke Skywalkers all visible at once, all of which in the middle of or waiting for their next scene. And how about those scenes where it goes all over the place, like one minute you're on Endor and all of a sudden you're in space, and then the next you're in the command center of Darth Vader's ship. And this is where it gets really nuts because yes, they are all in the same map and you can find every single one of these scenes by traveling around with the camera. And yeah, you might notice that the game footage is slowed down just a little bit and that's because there's no way to pause these scenes and they're also over before you know it. But yeah, this right here is a great demonstration of that. I also want to show you what they did for the more complicated cutscenes. And I gotta say, my favorite one is this one with Obi-Wan and Luke. You got all these different types of shots, like them looking off into the distance towards the town, them flying by on a speeder, and them on a cliff. Well, I gotta say, just moving the camera slightly answers a lot of questions, and it's really interesting. For example, the terrain with the speeder is one long piece of terrain, and it is moving to give off that sense of velocity. And when they're looking down over the town, they have no environment that they're standing on. They're just floating in midair, and that town is just a bent texture with some really low poly geometry to represent the buildings. And once again, I love the fact that I can zoom this all out and show you guys that all three of these set pieces are in one map. So we've seen a ton of great cubes, but at this point what we haven't seen is a very large red square. Now to my recollection, this is the only large red square that I've ever seen in the game, and it's also settled just outside the boundaries. So I figured we could call on to John Burton just one last time to get a little bit of an explanation on this mysterious block. The huge red rectangle may have been, and I stress the word may, a terrain wall that stopped the player from progressing, maybe underwater, beyond a certain point in the level until a given puzzle was completed. We certainly use that kind of thing a lot, but they are normally invisible. Maybe the invisibility flag was missed on this one as it was hidden underwater, or maybe the game's portal system clipped it during normal gameplay so it didn't waste any draw time and is only visible when you break those boundaries. Okay. 
before we wrap up this episode, I just wanted to talk about a few loose ends that we weren't able to get to in one single category for this episode. But it's all still very neat stuff that I want to share with you, so we're just going to flash through these. The fish that you briefly see in Moss Isley that kicks R2-D2 out of the water. There isn't anything more to the sea creature, but you will see an entire mottled fin that is supposed to represent it. Buttons work in a pretty funny way in LEGO Star Wars, so most buttons start off as red and then they turn green. However, the green part of the button is a completely different object, and so when you step on something or push something, that green object just gets pushed out in front of the red object. The scrolling story synopsis exists in a 3D space, so if we were to move the camera around, you can see that in a completely different angle. In almost any given situation when you're looking inside of a cockpit of a cutscene, those cockpits are not actually part of a ship, but rather a small set piece. When R2-D2 goes underneath the water and uses his little extension camera, the extension camera is in fact a completely different model. However, R2-D2 still remains underneath the water and is just never seen by the player. In this one little scene where you can send out a ship, not only does the ship remain in the map, but you can also see how large the texture is that's supposed to represent the outside. And for whatever reason, in this one cutscene where you first meet Jabba the Hutt, there is this screenshot used to represent a background element, and that image depicts three Gamorreans standing outside which for the record is never used in game. Also, this is what it looks like when Wicket travels through the crawl spaces. Although the camera trails downward to make it look like he's crawling down, the truth is he actually gets warped to the other location. Anyways guys, thank you very, very much for watching. John Burton, sir, thank you so, so much for giving us some answers on this episode. The information that you've been providing to all of us on your channel has been amazing and so helpful to anybody that wants to get into game development. I strongly encourage anybody to go visit his channel. I'll have a link in the video description down below. I absolutely love it and I can't wait for the next video, sir. And for those wondering about the Shorty Awards, I won't know if I'm in the final six until sometime early March, I'm assuming. So stay tuned for that. I will definitely update you as soon as I know what's going on. But as always, thank you so much for watching. And if you're new, make sure you click on the playlist on this screen here. There's over a hundred video games that I've covered at this point. So there's a good chance that one that you've played is somewhere on here. All right, guys, take it easy. Hope you had a good February vacation if you had one. And I will see you with a remake episode of Ocarina of Time. Take care.